Welcome, Michael. Thank you. I have no idea how I'm supposed to follow up a presentation that included Pokemon, Mario Maker, and Star Wars. That's just beyond me, <laughs> but I will do my best. So everyone, hello, welcome. This is going to be an intro to Rust. My name is Michael Snoyman, also by chance uh, hailing out of Israel uh, and happy to be speaking here today. Just a quick background on myself, perhaps a little bit relevant to understanding where this is going to be going. I've been a Haskell developer for 15 years and a Rust developer for about six years at this point. Uh, I bring a lot of that Haskell background with me and we will be getting into that in this talk. I am the co-author of the Begin Rust book and I wrote the Rust Crash Course, something that FB Complete provides. And I regularly do training on beginner and intermediate Rust and Haskell as well. My experience in the past few years has focused a lot on production apps in Rust, and it's kind of been all over the place. Back in servers, I've done a lot of blockchain work and smart contract work, building up CLIs, analytics tools, and more. So I'm going to try to pull in some of those concepts in this, uh, in this introduction. First question is, what is Rust? And I'm going to give the most bland explanation I can give you first, which is it's a systems programming language. It's a language designed to be a replacement or a competitor to C and C++. It doesn't have a garbage collector. You have complete manual memory management, uh, and you have a very big focus on high performance in Rust. And with that kind of bland, boring introduction, you may be wondering, why exactly am I speaking about this at a functional programming meetup? It doesn't seem to make any sense. The interesting thing about Rust is that while it is a systems programming language, there are a lot of features in here that would be very interesting to functional programmers and application developers in general. Uh, just to cherry pick some of the ideas, Rust has a very strong type system. And we'll get into what exactly a strong type system is, but it's a strong type system. If you're familiar with Haskell, it's very similar to the type system in Haskell, in fact. Uh, it is a memory safe language, a language that doesn't allow for undefined behavior. And this is in stark contrast to say C or C++, which make it very easy to run into undefined behavior. And this is one of the big uh, points drawing people in from the systems world into Rust while still making application level developers feel comfortable with the language. This is one that it took me a while to identify. Rust is an expression oriented language. Now that, that's not a surprise to people who know Rust. The thing that really caught me is I think this is where a lot of the functional feel of Rust comes from. We'll see what that looks like. There are very there are a lot of influences from FP languages. As we get to iterators, that's one of those, that's a really powerful example of functional programming, but there are others. You will hear this phrase tossed around a lot, zero cost abstractions. And the idea here should be is you should be able to, in Rust, write high-level code, use nice abstractions that provide safety and convenience without paying a runtime performance penalty. There's a fun phrase also, fearless concurrency. Rust is one of the best languages out there, in my opinion, for writing concurrent code. Many of the bugs that you can typically run into, even uh, cases like data races and deadlocks, these can be not completely prevented, but in many cases pushed away by the safety guarantees in the system. We are not going to get into some of those details today, but it's worth being aware of. Rust is also a language that has an amazing, amazing package manager out of the box, Cargo and the Crates ecosystem provide great packages, and we will be playing with a bunch of those packages today. And finally, Rust makes heavy usage of macros to avoid boilerplate, and we'll see some of these macros in play. The point of all this is that Rust is absolutely an amazing systems programming language. If you have to write an operating system, if you have to write a game, you have a real-time requirement embedded, sure, go ahead and use Rust. But don't be afraid to use it for application programming as well. Uh, in fact, all of the work that I've done in Rust would count as application uh, programming, not systems programming. Because I am legally required to start off with a hello world, we'll start with hello world. And this example is exactly what you get out of the box if you just open, install the, the Rust tooling and type in cargo new project name. This is a very typical hello world, uh, except there's a little bit of, this at least bothered me when I first started. Why, why is there an exclamation mark? It's just print LN. Why are there, why is, why is that there? And normally I'd wait for uh, answers, but we're going to skip over the me pausing, waiting for answers, and I'll just dive in. Rust, 
uh, in this case is actually using a macro. And it may feel a little overkill if you're coming from other languages. Why would you need a macro for something like this? And the idea is that println works with format strings. And these format strings are all compile time checked and to a fairly nice extent, in fact. You can see it does syntax checks. If you have unbalanced braces, they, they don't work. Checks that variables exist. It also checks, and this is starting to get into more of the type safety concepts, it also checks, is it actually possible to display this thing? This sum five is an optional value, and there's no built-in display for optional values for good reason, which we just don't know how to display it necessarily. And so Rust will actually block you from being able to do this at compile time. This works because now we've turned on debug output and we know how to do a debug output for this. And you can also do some interpolation like this by putting the variable separately. Point being, even from the very first line of code that you see in Rust, convenience and safety are the first things you're really getting to see in this language. Cargo.toml is the file that we use to define our dependencies and a bunch of other things about our, our code. We are going to be using a bunch of, uh, in fact, all of these libraries will get used uh, in the slides that are coming. So I will make the slides available after, uh, after this uh, talk. And if you want to play, play around with this, you'll be able to copy and paste this and then use the code samples that I've provided. OK. Oh, and also go to rustling.org. Very easy to get uh, set up. I will be doing some live coding in this, and I personally use VS Code with Rust Analyzer. It's a very nice combination of tooling. OK. Let's start off by getting a basic flavor for what this language looks like. We're just going to play around with a few basic concepts, and then we'll be able to move on. So up here, we have a use statement. This is where you import uh, things. And in this case, we are going to imp import the display trait from the std crate, and inside the std crate, the FMT module. And we use the double colon or to namespace between these different uh, aspects. Now we have display in, in scope, and we will be able to use that down below. This is where we define a struct. And if you come from a functional programming background, you may have heard terms like product and some types before. Uh, I will define them briefly, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. Here I'm defining a staff member, and a staff member is going to have two fields. There's going to be a name, which is a string, and a job, which is a job type. This is the first place where I say Rust is awesome. Enum job. Enums in Rust are some types. If you're familiar with Haskell like I am, you're used to the concept of an ADT, an algebraic data type. That's a kind of scary term. But the idea here is we are able to say a job is either a principal or a teacher. And if you happen to be a teacher, the teacher will come along with the subject. And the subject is also an enum. And that's going to be either history or physics. Now that we've defined our data types, I'm going to go ahead and start writing some code. So we start off in our main function. The main function is going to define a new staff variable. And this is how we construct one of these values. We use the staff constructor. We fill in the fields. We are going to call our staff member Alice, and Alice is going to be a physics teacher. And again, we use the double colon to do namespacing. We get access to these variants. That's the term we use for them in, in Rust. So teacher and physics are both variants of job and subject. And then Rust kind of has a little bit of an object-oriented flavor as well. So we are going to call the greet method on the staff. And this is how we define a greet method. We have this info block for staff. We are going to take a reference to self. We're not actually in this talk going to get a lot into ownership and references and borrowing, but that is a, arguably it is the core feature of Rust. The fact that we use ownership in order to avoid a lot of the memory safety bugs that can exist in other systems programming languages. It's arguably the most complicated thing you have to learn in Rust. Uh, and I would argue, I would recommend, this is definitely something worth spending time learning. It pays a lot of dividends. But we're not going to get into that today, because we're going to instead play with more fun aspects of the language. So inside our greet uh, function, greet method, we now have access to self. And we can print out information on this person. 
So we're going to uh, we're going to say hello name. Your job is job. You might be wondering how exactly does Rust know how to print out well name? Fine, it's just a string. How does it know how to print out job? That's where the display trait comes in, and we'll get to that in a sec. The other way of doing this is you can actually do pattern matching and destructuring of data like this. And so if you come from another language that has pattern matching, you may be used to this concept. And the idea here is I am able to take some larger data type and break it down into its individual fields and then use these directly. Pattern matching is a very powerful feature. This is just scratching the surface. We'll see a few more examples below. OK. But one of our questions was, how exactly do I know how to display this job? And that is where the display trait comes into play. If you're coming from an object-oriented background, traits are kind of like interfaces. If you're coming from a functional programming background, they're very similar or in many ways identical to type classes. And the display trait is a built-in part of the standard library, and it's used by the printl and macro. When we use this syntax for embedding a value, we are saying, please go off to the display trait and use that to display our value. And now inside here, inside the display impl, we are going to define a method, fmt, and fmt is going to be used for formatting these values. And once again, we are going to use pattern matching. So now that we have a job, we can see, is this a principal or is this a teacher? If you've never worked with a functional programming language that has the combination of some types and pattern matching, I strongly recommend uh, getting, getting some experience with it. It, it. I use this all over the time in every code base I've worked in, and you'll see some more real world examples. I think I have some real world examples of this later on in the slides. So here I'm gonna use another macro. Like I mentioned, Rust is a very, very macro friendly language. We're going to write principal into this formatter. And here I'm gonna write the subject teacher into this formatter, and same thing down here just providing a uh, display impl for subject. One other really cool thing, I mentioned zero cost abstractions. You may notice this doesn't say anything about writing to STD out, doesn't say if it's writing to a file, doesn't say if it's writing to an in-memory buffer. This format or abstraction allows you to write to all of these different uh, data sinks, these destinations, uh, very efficiently. So you can use the same method, instead of printing out to STD out, I could instead say this. And now to string is going to efficiently fill up a buffer in memory. And so again, you're able to reuse this code, use it for multiple different purposes, and keep efficiency at the same time. OK, so that is our quick uh, basic flavor of the language. Now let's get into some more interesting things. Iterators. I throw this one in first for functional programming audiences because this is so similar to functional programming. This, again, I will copy this over to VS Code and we'll play with it here. This is a contrived example that I use very often. I want to go through the numbers zero through 99. I want to take all the multiples of three, add one to all of them, and then take the values as long as they are less than 50 and print each one of these out. You could do this in other ways in Rust. You could use an explicit for loop. You could use a whole bunch of mutable code uh, the same way you would in C or C++, in JavaScript, or in lots of other languages. But this is the way that I would recommend you actually do it in real life. Here, we are using an iterator. This value here is not an array. It doesn't take up. 100 values in memory. It doesn't allocate anything on the heap. Instead, it will efficiently create a data structure that will pop one value off at a time on demand. Each one of these iterator adapters, filter, map, and take while, will then perform some kind of an action on that stream of values coming from that iterator. And finally, our consumer function for each will take each one of those values that actually gets yielded from this entire iterator here, and then perform an action on it. In this case, the action we are going to perform is just printing out the number. Now, there are lots of other ways of doing this. You could, for example,
you could do the whole thing with a for loop instead. And that works. I would argue it's slightly less elegant, but it might be more natural. The nice thing about this is the fact that iterators power every for loop that exists in Rust. And again, you get the zero cost abstraction idea. I want to be able to use an efficient iterator. I want to avoid allocating memory on the heap or allocating memory at all if I can. And, but I want to be able to use the data, the uh, common command structures like that I'm already used to. So that's a very cool aspect of the language. Okay, let's talk about error handling. Rust is a language that does not have and doesn't believe in runtime exceptions. You could argue a little bit about this because Rust does have a concept called panicking, and panicking kind of, sort of, behaves like a runtime exception, but it's intended for catastrophic events. It's not intended for normal control flow in the, in the application. Instead, in Rust, the recommendation is to use uh, explicit errors and explicit error types. This is able to leverage the result data type, and this is one of those cool things in the language. Result is an enum. It is either OK or error. Those are the two possibilities. And basically, every library, every tool, anything you're ever going to work with in the Rust ecosystem will end up using the same result for error handling. And this provides a very convenient way to, to handle things. One of the common issues you run into when doing error handling in, in, many, in other languages is it's easy to forget to handle the error. Common case? Let's say that you are going to use printf in C. Technically, you are supposed to check the return code from printf every time you use it. Most people don't, uh, but there's nothing in the compiler to, to enforce that. In Rust, there's a must use pragma, and this must use pragma can be put on data types to say, hey, if this value comes into existence, you have to do something to deal with it. And I'll show you what happens when you don't do that. Uh, and then on top of everything else, there are some great libraries to make working with errors much easier and, uh, and make it possible to do good error handling. Uh, anyhow, in this error are two different version, are two different libraries that are commonly used. I'll be talking about anyhow because it's the library I use the most and I think is the one that especially people coming from an exception background are most used to. All right, let's look at this example. Our main function now returns a result. If this main function return, <clears throat> sorry, if this main function returns OK, which is what we see down here, then the program exits normally, no problem. But if it returns error, then the program is automatically going to return a failure status code and print out information on what went wrong. Going down here, I am now going to open up the file. So I'm using this helper create FS error, which provides very nice error messages when uh, anything goes wrong with the file. I'm going to open this. You may notice this question mark at the end. This question mark says, if this, if this expression fails, if it returns an error, return that error from this function. And so in many ways, you can kind of simulate uh, runtime exceptions in, the, in your normal code. It's very terse syntax. And if I take it off and I save this file, nothing works. Because now our file is a different type. It's now a result of file and error. There's no way for me to get access to that file without dealing with the, uh, the error case. Now I could not use the question mark. Instead, I could use the same pattern matching we saw before. And I can say if it's a file, return a file. And if it's an error, I could do something like But the reality is what I'm implementing right now is more or less exactly what the compiler will build for me automatically just by using the question mark operator. So you get the benefit of if you want to be able to handle an error, it's very easy to do so. But in the very common case of I just want to propagate this back upstream, you can do that. OK, now that I've got my file, I want to read lines out of the file. I have to use a buff reader adapter so that I have, a, I have a buffered file reader because I'm about to read it line by line. And once again, we're able to see iterators come into play. Now that I have this buffered file, I can use the lines method to get an iterator 
which will give me all of the individual lines in the fun in the file. And I will use enumerate to give me the line number. Now I get back a pair of the index, meaning which line in the file are we at, and the line. This is another interesting part of error handling. As you read more and more lines out of the file, it's entirely possible that a new error is going to occur, something that didn't occur when opening the file. And so Rust gives you a result at this point as well. Here, we do the very common approach of inside the for loop, go ahead and deal with the error. And if it's not there, get back a line. This bit here is a piece of code I would strongly recommend using when you're using Rust, which is context from anyhow. Oftentimes when you get error messages, you don't know where they're coming from. You look at, you can look at stack traces. Rust has back you know, the Rust backtrace environment variable to get better uh, backtraces when an error happens, but it can be very convenient to be able to say something happened. This is a very simple kind of context saying, uh, saying something happened, but you can also build up more complex examples like this. And once again, we're reusing the same format strings that we've seen previously. Final thing on error handling before we move on is types matter. This Rust function, main, has to return a result. Since it returns a result, I can use the question mark operator throughout. If I take that off, question mark operator is no longer, and by the way, it's called the try operator. I keep calling it a question mark, but it's called the try operator. <clears throat> Once I take off that return type, then main is supposed to return void or unit. If it's returning unit, you can't use question mark here because it doesn't make any sense. But since the function actually does return a result, I have to make sure that I do, in fact, return a result from the end. And this is what I'm doing here. This, in particular, is a really weird bit of Rust code, and I think it drives people crazy the first time they see it. The inner set of parentheses is the unit value, meaning nothing happened, kind of like void in many other programming languages. And then we wrap it up with OK. And that's why we have that double nesting, what looks like double nesting of parentheses. Okay, that is now good on scratching the surface for, um, for error handling. Let's move on to another bit of code. Okay, cool. So prime factors. This is going to be a somewhat complete uh, bit of code, complete with test suites, which yes, I do occasionally write test suites. We have a helper function up here, read line. I kind of wish this was included in the standard library, but it isn't. Uh, and it's a little bit awkward doing this. Uh, again, I kind of wish it was in the standard library. The idea here is we're going to create a new string. We're going to read, we're going to get the standard input handle, and then we are going to read a line of input from standard input into this mutable string. I'm not doing good error handling here. I'm just unwrapping and throwing away the error messages in if I was going to do this correctly, then I would instead do something like this, where I say there's actually a possibility that this thing can fail. We're ignoring errors for the moment, though. OK. Now we're going to come to our main function. Oh, and I should actually run these things. There's no point in using VS Code if I'm not actually going to run it. I'll remember to run this by the end. All right. So our main function. We want someone to get, we want the user to give us an integer somewhere between between one and the maximum possible U16 representation. We'll read that in from the input. In fact, I'll just show this working. Let's give it a cool number like 42. And it tells us the, the prime factors are two, three, and seven. And sure enough, two times three is six, six times seven is 42. So math works, the program works. Let's see how we implement this. So we'll take this input, we'll trim off any white space that comes in at the end, like the new line character, parse it, and once again, we'll just throw away the error, the errors because we don't, we don't care about it in this case. Then we are going to use our prime factors function to get back a vec, a vector of all the different factors. And then we can use the for loop to be able to iterate over this and print out all of the prime factors, which is exactly what you saw right here. Now we get to get into some fun rust. How do, we how do we calculate the prime factors of a number? So we're gonna start off with some input. 
We're going to make sure that it's not zero. And now we are going to keep track of the factors we've discovered. We're going to keep track of the prime numbers that we found and the current prime number that we're testing with. There are far more efficient ways to do this than, way, than the way I'm about to do, um, uh, do it here. I went for simplicity here. There are much better algorithms for coming up with prime numbers, but efficiency wasn't really the point here. As long as input is not equal to one, we need to keep going and find, it, and find more prime factors. So if input um, modulus curve prime is equal to zero, that means that the current prime number does in fact divide into the input, and therefore the, it's one of the prime factors of the number. In that case, we will add the current, the current prime as one of the factors, divide out input, divide, in, uh, input will now get reduced by the current prime. You'll notice perhaps different if you're coming from a functional programming background like I am, mutability is right out of the box in Rust. Now, in order to be mutable, you have to declare your variables as mutable. It doesn't happen. Uh, the default is immutable, which is nice. If the current prime doesn't actually divide in, though, instead, we want to calculate what the next prime is, push that onto the list of primes, and then keep going. And eventually, we will return all the, fac the factors at the end. Just for sake of time, I'm not going to go into all the details about next prime. Not terribly interesting, but the, uh, the code will be available later for anyone who wants to look at it. The next interesting thing is how we do tests in Rust. This is a very common way of setting that up. It's not technically necessary to put everything into its own module, but by convention, that's what we do. We say only build this if this is if we're running the test suite. Here are the tests, and each one of them gets this little test attribute added to it. And these are standard unit tests, the way that I've written this here. So if you uh, take the prime factors of one, it should give you an empty vec. If you use these prime numbers, you should get back a singleton vec, and then just some arbitrary numbers. Very nice. But we can go further. And once again, if you are a functional programmer who's familiar with quick check and the property testing approach to things, you may like this. Quick check is a library which will allow us to write a function. The function is going to take some input, and quick check will generate random values and run this function. 100 times, 1,000 times, whatever the default is, or however you want to override the default. And it will confirm that this property works. So here I'm saying, since we're not allowed to check against 0, I make sure that it's not 0. Otherwise, it confirms that if you take the prime factors of a number, and then you get the product of them, it comes back to the original, which is a pretty nice property test for something like finding prime factors. This little bit of code also demonstrates the functional nature of Rust. So here I've gotten the vec of prime factors. I convert it into an iterator. And right here, I'm able to use the product method in order to construct a new value. Oftentimes, we would look at this uh, in other languages and imperative languages and use mutability to make this happen. This is another place where I've, I definitely feel at home, like it's a functional programming language. Notice how this test has no mutability going on inside of it. And that makes me a big fan of it. OK, now let's branch out to some more interesting libraries. This one is called Serity. Uh, I think there are a number of different ways of pronouncing it. This is the way that I've standardized on, but eh, might be wrong. The Serity stands for Serialize and Deserialize Data. It has a derived system based off of macros, which we're going to uh, look at. It makes it very easy to be able to serialize and deserialize data. Uh, custom, you know, different kinds of custom formats. There are many different formats supported out of the box, meaning if you go to crates and you look for Serity, or you just go to serity.rs, you will see JSON, YAML, CSV, TOML, uh, message pack, and I think about a dozen other um, data formats that are all supported by Serity. So it's very nice to be able to just define your data types once and know that you will be able to use this for lots of different uh, serialization formats. It's also leveraged extensively throughout the Rust ecosystem. So basically, I can't say everything that's going to do data serialization uses Serity, but all of the main libraries that I've ever used have had Serity support. OK, so now let's go ahead and look at our example. Oh, you know what? I lied. I said I was going to 
just on the previous slide, I'm going to run the test suite so everyone can see this thing actually run in practice. You can see it building all of the different dependencies. Oh no, it failed. What did I do? Oh, multiply with over four. Okay. Also something worth mentioning. If you, yeah, overflows or panics. So I write crappy code. Good to know. I'll have to look into that later. I don't remember what, I thought I tested this beforehand, but apparently not. Oh, yeah. finished it. Yeah, it's because I changed the code and didn't save. Okay. So now I feel a little better about myself, but that's the way the test suites get run in Rust. Okay. If I'm done interrupting myself, we will go back to this other example. It's Sarah. We're going to be using anyhow again for error handling, and we're going to use the rand crate for getting some random numbers. And what I'm going to be doing here is I am going to define a data type called point, which is going to represent an xy coordinate. Why? Because it was the first thing I thought of. This here is all the work you need to do in order to make this thing work with Serity. We've said that I would like to automatically derive serialize and deserialize uh, impuls for these two different traits. You can override a bunch of things. For example, I could say this should be x cord or something else, which looks pretty stupid, but I could do that if I wanted to. I'm not going to. We're just going to use the defaults here. But there are a bunch of, ma of attributes that you can use to customize the way that Serity uh, serializes and deserializes. I use this extensively in the code that I write. OK. Again, we are using an impl block, like we saw previously. This is for providing a static method uh, or a namespaced function called random. Random is just going to get a random number generator and then randomly generate a number between negative 500 and 500 for both the x and y coordinates. Down here in the main function, we are going to Notice the question marks again. I'm not going to comment on them anymore. We're going to open up a CSV file called points.csv. We're going to iterate through the numbers one through 100, one through 1,000, so just 1,000 times. And we will write a random point of data 1,000 times, flush it to disk, which technically isn't necessary. Uh, I like to do it. I like to be explicit about it. And then you can also put some information like this in the context, which can be very nice. And here I'm going to drop. Dropping, what's that? Dropping is, a, is the core mechanism in Rust for handling ownership and ensuring that things get cleaned up. The main purpose for it is memory management, but it ends up getting used for many other things in Rust. In this case, we're using dropping uh, to guarantee that the file handle gets closed at the right time. This kind of drop mechanism is used for other things, for example, locking a mutex and other kinds of uh, other kinds of concurrency issues, semaphores, RW locks, those kinds of things. So it ends up being a very powerful feature we get to use all over the place. Okay, now that we've written our data to disk, we can read it back. So we're going to use the CSV package again. We're going to open up points.csv a second time. We will use into deserialize. Into deserialize will give us a, an iterator of points, of result points, because there may be some kind of a parse error or an IO error. And then we will collect them back together. We uh, collect into a result that does automatic error handling, short circuiting, and it will either give us back a VEC of all the different points, or it will give us back an error message, and we can move on from there. Once we have this VEC of points, writing it to either a JSON or a YAML file is trivial. Here I'm using two writer pretty uh, to give us a nice looking JSON file or Serdi's two writer. Let's come in here, let's run this, and I can pop open these files and we can see what they look like. So you can see we do actually have CSV data, matching JSON data, and matching YAML data. You want to use Toml, you want to use Message Pack or anything else, pretty easy to be able to add that in as well. Okay. Let's keep going down the stack. I updated that. There we go. Man line tooling. There is a great library called Clap. Uh, if you're going to be writing command line uh, tools in Rust, definitely recommend checking it out. 
And as you may notice as a theme, it uses macros, deriving, and attributes all over the place to make it very easy to define a command line interface. It also makes heavy usage of ADTs and uh, some types, product types, in order to make this work. So let's check it out. Close this again, close this again. So since ChatGPT is so popular right now, I decided let's do a chatbot. And we are going to the, have this uh, set of options. <clears throat> this opt represents all the command line options. We can provide a chatbot. But you look up here at these attributes. And it says, well, you can specify this as a long option, which would be something like dash dash chat bot name at GPT. We can also specify it as an environment variable and instead say chat bot name equals blah, something else. And we can have a default value. And the default value here is Eliza for anyone who's old enough to remember what that is. Uh, and then we have a clap subcommand. This is where the enums come into play. Because here, I'm able to define a few different things I may want to do. And at this point, we may as well just run this. So say hello. Oops, didn't work. Because name is a required argument, and we didn't provide it. So my name is Michael. Good afternoon, Michael. My name is Eliza. I can also say that the time should be morning. And it tells me good morning, which is nice. And I can say, what do I call that? Chatbot name equals now. And that's very ominous. Oops, that's even worse. And of course, we can also do say goodbye, in which case we do not need a name or a time because it's not specified there. So right off the bat, this is pretty cool. You specify your, your data once, you get back nice, well-structured, well-typed data, data values. You don't have to worry about something failing. Uh, you know, once you get past the initial parse, all the data is simply there. It also takes advantage of existing traits in the Rust ecosystem. So I've specified time of day to be either morning, afternoon, or evening. How exactly did Rust know that I had a parse set and how to render that? Well, I told it. We have the trait called from string for parsing. We have a, the trait we saw before, display for rendering. If this looks kind of tedious to have to write all this stuff out, there are helper crates for doing it. Uh, personally, I haven't actually used those helper crates that I probably should, uh, but I also wanted to be able to show this off, what the code actually looks like in practice. So we've got display, we've got from str, and down here, in order to parse, this is all the work we do. We use the same pattern matching with destructuring right here. And then we're able to simply pattern match and decide what we want to do with this input. OK, I think I'm running low on time at this point. I think we've got about six minutes left. So I am going to move on to the last, yeah, last two examples. One of them is a web client. The async await ecosystem in Rust is awesome. Tokyo is the most popular library for working with this, and there are many add-on crates available in the ecosystem for, um, for working, with, uh, you know, working with a bunch of different things. One of them is Request. Request is a crate built on top of the lower-level hyper package, and it's used for making HTTP requests. And this is a nice little overview. This here, believe it or not, is a macro. This macro says, please run the main function with the Tokyo runtime. We build up a, a request client. You can set any kind of parameters. I'm being much more verbose here than we actually need to be. Our request just provides a get method out of the box that we could have used. But I wanted to give you a little bit more of a real life example where you'd have to make some modifications. So we modify the user agent. And then with this client, we're able to get a URL, send the request, we use dot await. This is the async await syntax that I was talking about. And as I mentioned, built-in CRD support, it will automatically use CRD for deserializing the data that comes back. We await again, and then we can print out our response. Just so everyone can see what that looks, what this um, body looks like in the browser, it looks like this. And I've ignored a few of the fields 
but I've defined our JSON response type down here. I've just stuck deserialize, deserialize, and debug so that we can print this out very easily. And those fields, let's do that. Those fields simply get parsed directly. And so we end up with this kind of output. So with a relatively small amount of code and no work at deserializing, I was able to make an, H an HTTPS request, get a JSON value, parse it, and print it out, which is kind of nice. And the final bit of code that we're going to look at today is a web server. There are a bunch of libraries in the Rust ecosystem. There is, um, I can't, I think Actix Web is very popular. Hyper, which is a lower level library, has a bunch of uh, servers built on top of on top of it. Warp is one of them. Axum is a relatively new library. I think it's been out for about a year and a half now, maybe a little less. I've been using it extensively since then. I'm a very big fan of it, but I can't tell you that, any, I mean, but all the libraries are very nice. And let's see this in practice. So we'll start off at the main function. So our main function is going to use uh, clap to get the command line arguments. Command line arguments here are going to say which host and port to bind to, you get a socket address, and it's able to simply parse this or use the default value. Again, we're going to build up a, a request client. We'll see where that, that gets used in a second. We build up a router saying the different endpoints that we want to support. Already I'll start running this program and saying we want to use, we want to provide a get request using these three different functions. We bind the port, we serve our service, and we await because again, this is part of Tokyo async and await. Just to give you an idea of looking at these uh, these functions up here, hello world just returns a static string, nothing interesting. Random number. Here we are going to return a JSON representation of a random number. We will randomly generate it, shove it into this structure. We wrap it up with JSON and Axum, once again, built in support for SARD and SARD JSON. And it will, in fact, when I do this right now, I probably can. And you can see each time I reload, it just gives me a different number. For completeness, there's hello world. And finally, because these are kind of boring, down here, we have Relay, which is going to use the same code we saw before to request this JSON value from HTTP bin. It's going to get the value back. It's going to return a JSON value, and we have to do error handling. And so we will return an error occurred value here. There are other ways to handle it, but that's the way that I you can return different status codes. I kept it relatively simple here. And so if we go to the slash Relay, it'll take a little bit longer and then we'll see the same JSON message that we saw previously. Okay. So tying up a uh, comparison and especially a comparison against Haskell because that's what I'm most familiar with. In the style of FP, Rust has traits, ADTs. It's immutable by default. It uses strong typing, which I recognize is not a universal FP feature, but it is a Haskell feature. Iterators are very similar to lazy composition that you would see in Haskell. I know that other FB languages have other approaches to being able to stream data and expression oriented. We didn't actually see that much of the expression oriented aspect of the language, but it's definitely there and it's a pleasure to work with. Unlike FP, there's no garbage collection and therefore you have to deal with ownership all over the place. My personal take is that for most application development, the benefits of the extra speed you get from garbage collection of, or no garbage collection probably isn't worth the ownership overhead you have to pay, but all the extra features you get in Rust because of the way that the ownership system works kind of makes it worthwhile, even though you are paying a little bit of an overhead as you start working with it. Over time, you get more used to, to uh, dealing with ownership. Rust overall avoids more advanced techniques like higher kind of types. And in contrast to a language like Haskell, instead of having a general purpose notation like do notation, uh, Rust prefers very specific notation like question mark for errors and dot await for uh, async await. Uh, plenty of other use cases, but we're out of time at this point. So feel free to go through those. Sounds like we're not going to be doing a Q&A session, but if anyone has questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I'm Snowyberg on Twitter. 
and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Great presentation and also a great introduction and presentation to Rust for functional programmers. And uh, as you said, uh, also you, all your material, you had like a lot of material. We'll link it and we'll put it into the description of the live stream so anyone can see it afterwards if they want to, you know, check out, run the examples, etc. At this point, uh, there's no questions. However, um, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, there's just like uh, people are clapping in the chat, so they're like happy. Thank you very much. Very, very nice presentation.